Hello and welcome everybody. I am Mary Shores coming to you live from Fearless Ambition and the Mary Shores page. And today I have with me special guest expert, Dr. Michelle Karoulis. She is a Northwestern professor of counseling and an expert in sports and exercise psychology. She teaches these skills professionally and she's joining me today so she can share with them share them all with you. Now in this training specifically, we're gonna learn five skills to help strengthen our confidence. Dr. Michelle is sharing what she teaches to professional and elite athletes, also high performing executives and entrepreneurs. And it really resulted in a change in their outlook that leads to more successful patterns in their life. So welcome Michelle and tell me why do people why do people find confidence so important? Thank you, Mary. So people talk about confidence on such a regular basis and our experiences really shape our perceptions of the world and the way we view different situations. So if we have positive uplifting experiences, that tends to lead to confidence. And when we have experiences that aren't so great, people have a little bit less confidence or sometimes a lot less confidence. And life throws curveballs. So we are going to have a mixture of both positive and negative situations. So what I like to do when I talk about confidence is teach people about how to take learning points from all of our life experiences and utilize that to build and maintain their own individual levels of confidence. That sounds really exciting. And um, I know you're going to walk us through that today. So where is the starting point? So the starting point with confidence is to know your information and what is it that you want to learn about to be confident. So when I work with professional athletes or executives, entrepreneurs, they know their stuff. So it takes time to learn a specific skill and to be able to really utilize what you've learned to develop your skills. And that's how you develop uh, a way of knowing with a certain situation. So with entrepreneurs, when they go and talk to their clients or they go to build business, they know their materials, they know their statistics, they know their numbers, so they can speak about that to other people. Athletes spend hours and hours and hours fine-tuning their bodies, their gross motor skills, their fine motor skills, their sports psychology skills. So they have the baseline abilities and the confidence in those abilities to be able to take them to the next level. So what I'm finding fascinating about this is because it does seem that maybe when somebody is new to a certain to a certain skill set, sometimes I'm, I'm thinking about this confidence as a piece is they might interpret that lack of confidence as to that they're not capable of doing the job when maybe it's just that they're uncomfortable because they haven't gotten enough practice at it yet. They don't know, they're not at that level. One of the things that I say is that I need to know something inside, outside, backwards and forwards. And it seems like when I hit that tipping point, I feel almost unstoppable and able to, and able to like do that job. And I, and I often describe that as a feeling of empowerment. Exactly. That's exactly right. And what you just described is reframing your idea of success and reframing people's ideas of failures. So when we try something and we don't succeed, people often call that a failure. I teach people to completely reframe that. When we try a new skill or we try something new, chances are it's going to take time to be able to ace that. So it's not a failure if we don't do it perfectly the first time. It's a stepping stone. So to be able to perceive our experiences as stepping stones and building upon really that base knowledge, that helps people understand, okay, I'm not a failure. I didn't necessarily do something wrong. I am just learning how to enhance my skills that I'm learning. So redefining is the second step, and that's extremely important. It's part of a cognitive behavioral therapy. We call it CBT, cognitive restructuring. But an easy way to say it, reframe your idea of failure. Okay, so I'm loving this. So the first step is the information gathering stage. When you are, when you are putting enough hours into something that you know it inside, outside, backwards, and forwards, and then you have this reframing. And can you tell me just a little bit more about that? If I wanted to reframe my position on something, what would that look like? So the, the first, world? 
the first step is to recognize that you have a negative thought and a negative perception about a situation or an experience. And just take note of that and say, okay, I realize that I, I feel something that's not pleasant with the situation. And then it's looking at the words you're using. So it might be, um, if we're talking about a sport experience, it might be, I uh, didn't do well in this game and I didn't have endurance. So that's a clear statement. And maybe we can reframe or rephrase that into something like, even though I didn't do as well as I wanted to, I'm working on my endurance and I'll l learn skills to improve next time. So and I, I know for myself, a lot of times there, for me, looking in terms of success, one of the things that I felt like I've always done very well is even though I may be frustrated when a situation didn't go my way, and it's and it's oftentimes stressful when things didn't turn out the way that I wanted them to, um, I do have a tendency after a couple of days to step back and say, well, what have I learned? And I'll, And another thing that I will say is that everything happens the way it's supposed to, to, to lead me in the direction of where I'm going to go. So if I failed, if I quote unquote failed at this, then I know that the next time I'm going to take those, I'm going to take those things that I learned so that the, the time that I try it the next time, I'm going to do really well. You know, when I was, um, when I was writing the book Conscious Communications and I was working with an editor, she was, I remember she wanted to do her first, like a Facebook live, kind of like what we're doing. You know, she had people register and and she wanted to teach some kind of story coaching. And she was really excited and she planned it out for months. And then it didn't go the way that she wanted to. And I remember her saying to me, I'm never doing this again. So right then and there, you know, it was such a traumatic experience for her to to go through that perceived failure because it didn't go the way she wanted it to go, that she was saying those words that I felt were very limiting of, I'll never do this again. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, you know, what are all the things that went wrong and aren't those things you could fix the next time around? Or what would you do different? Like now that you've done it one time, what, what, would, what would I do different next time? Is that an example of reframing? That is exactly an example of reframing, and that's a great um, transition into our third step, which is to accept feedback gracefully. So mm -hmm. what, what happens with the example that you gave, and writing, is a, writing and editing is a wonderful example, because I have talked to countless authors who have submitted a piece that wasn't accepted, or they, they are upset about the feedback that their author gave them, or uh, on an academic level, I grade countless student papers. I can't tell you how many papers I grade and provide extensive feedback for my students. And I always preface that feedback with, this is information to help you learn. It is not any, in any way, shape or form, a comment or a, anything about you as a person. This is, this is a piece of paper and a document with words for the purpose of helping you um, improve. So I think that example that you gave in terms of helping um, your editor and learning about how to do something differently the next time is key value and to be open to that. And I think a lot of times when people receive feedback, they take it as a personal insult or feeling as if they're not good enough. And those kinds of patterns can track people throughout life. And so one experience where someone might feel, I'm just not good enough, that could lead into different areas of life. So maybe in a work situation, somebody didn't feel good enough, and then there could be a challenge in a personal relationship, in a friendship, romantic relationship, family, and the person might say again, shoot, I'm just not good enough. And it's not about that. It's about learning, improving, and listening to other people. So we want to listen to how other people experience us experiencing the world. So if we can give feedback in a kind way and accept feedback and listen to feedback gracefully, that really helps us learn to see the world in a new light and helps us maybe see things that we didn't see before that other people can notice. 
Yeah, I'm totally, I'm totally feeling that. And I've got, I'm going to make some comments about this, this third part of it. And before I do that, I just want to mention to all of the people watching that you are absolutely free to put questions. If you have any questions about this, or you want to give a specific um, example, you can do that in the Q and A. And then once we get through the steps, another option is if you click raise your hand, then I'll be able to bring you on and you can talk with us live. And if you have a camera and you want to to be live on camera, we can do that for you too. So just to let you know some of the options. So going to this, this third step, which what was the one word for the third step? Gracefully accept feedback. Gracefully accept feedback. So as I'm hearing, it's, it's a much deeper issue than just the feedback in and of itself. Because if you already have a belief system that you can't do something or that you're not good enough, then now this situation is actually beginning to provide you evidence that that is true. So it's easier for you to fall into that belief. And now this reinforces the fact that you're not good enough. So we need to reframe the way that we're looking. We need to be able to gracefully accept that feedback and instead of accepting it from a place of criticism, what's something that if I'm, if, because we all are, we're, every single one of us is in a position where we have to accept feedback. And especially if we've worked really, really hard on something. Um, you know, I remember one time when I was doing a training at a client's office, and this was many years ago, but it wasn't going very well. And at the end of the first day, I thought, you know, it just, it wasn't going, going well. And I remember I was asking for feedback and I could have, I could have shown up the next day and I could have provided that very same, that very same training in the exact same way. But instead I took this information and I, I rearranged it following that feedback, but I don't remember ever feeling hurt over the feedback because it, I didn't take any of it personally. But there are so many times, especially when the relationships get closer and closer. So if it was, you know, if it's it's a somebody that's much more closer to me to receive that that feedback can be difficult. So do you have anything that you would say as far as like if you and I were in a conversation and I said to you, you know, I got this feedback and and even though I know that the person gave this to me for my learning. I still feel, I still in, inside, I still feel like I'm taking it very personally. Yes, I think it's important to be aware of that. And also sometimes miscommunications do happen. So to clarify from the person who's talking to you and to say this, you know, this hurts my feelings, but can you explain to me a little bit more about maybe how our interaction um, led you to have this conversation with me or how our interaction might have been misinterpreted. And I think it's also really helpful to have people in our lives we can count on to say, here's a situation that happened and you know me really well. What's your perspective of this situation? Can you help me understand it? Sometimes an outside right. person can help with that. And, and it sounds too like th that the real magic is happening as you're putting all of this together in a flow. So, yes. you know, in, in using the, using the example of my editor friend, you know, maybe because she hadn't done that before it is, it can be when you go in camera, I, I know that you do it all the time because you're now teaching online classes through, through Northwestern, but when you're doing it the first few times, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable, you know, and so you, you don't know where to look always. And I, you know, I still deal with that. So the more she would have had information about it before, and it's not something you can like, especially if you're doing a Facebook live, you can't just practice that because you're live. Because you're live. <laughs> so, right. So you don't really, but if you have that opportunity to gather as much information as you need, then reframe the, any kind of failure around it. So when it doesn't go exactly the way that you would like it to begin to reframe that and look at it as a learning opportunity, and maybe even start looking at asking yourself the questions, well, what things did go right? Yes. Because typically in a failure situation or in a situation where something didn't go the way you wanted it to, typically it's not all, you know, all of the pieces that got messed up. Maybe it's, you know, one or two, but one part went really, really well. And so I like that for reframing piece for, for many, many reasons. And then when you add this, because, you know, I, I'm sure that she got feedback from people who were watching and, and that probably actually added to her insult because she was already feeling internally like she didn't do it very well. So being able to, being able to receive feedback as a gift, which I really do always appreciate. 
Yes. And sometimes people can be just downright mean online. So that we have to learn how to weed that kind of stuff out. But to be able to listen and learn and um, hear people's opinions is really important. And it's also important for us to be able to give those opinions to others in a, in a kind and helpful way. So we want to, and, and you know this with conscious communications, we want to speak with to other people in ways where they're open to hearing our message. So that's important. Right. I'm always in communication. Often I'm talking about that we have some basic human needs and one of those needs is to feel heard. And so that would be useful in this type of a situation as well, because when we feel heard, we can move on to the next step. We can move on more to acceptance and we can even move on then to the solution portion, you know, learning how to get falling through to solve the problem is really great at that point. So what is our fourth step? So our fourth step you touched upon, and that's recalling past successes. So not only looking at what we've done well in the situation we're examining, but what have we done well in the past? And how are those things uh, building blocks to continued success and to continued confidence? So the more we achieve our goals, the more we achieve things we want to do in all domains of life, that will continue to build upon our confidence. So if we can keep uh, files, mental files, about things that we have done really well, especially when we're struggling, those can serve as motivation to help us continue to want to move forward in building our own confidence, building our own success. And it's, it's, these steps are, aren't necessarily something we go through just once. It can be, these can be repeated in um, multiple ways to help us move forward and to, to get that internal strength that we're looking for. Okay, so I find this fascinating that, that you said this about recalling past wins, because um, I did some research on this when I was writing the book, and I have this process, it's called Five Steps to Break Through Your Breakdown, and one of the steps is recalling past wins, and the research that I did reveals that when you recall a past situation, so when if you ask yourself the question, when have I been able to work through a similar situation, uh, what happens in the brain and in the body is that the brain recalls the memory and when it recalls the memory, it recreates the chemicals in your body. Well, anytime you win something, there's sort of this like, um, you know, this, uh, some, you know, with Amy Cuddy and the, the body language, um, the power posturing and stuff like that. So just by recalling a past memory, it's actually going to recall the same chemicals that were flowing through your through your body during the win that you're recalling. So if that was that you want to race, then you'll start to feel that same adrenaline rush and those same endorphins from, and I would imagine that this is very true in sports psychology, that you start to, I always tell it, I, always, I, I use this example to explain this phenomenon just because we'll all understand this. If you've ever known a man in your life that tells either the, the when he caught the big fish story or when he hit the baseball out of the park or you know like when he's really telling his big win story and the thing that i've noticed is that you know my grandpa when he would tell the the big fish story that fish got bigger <laughs> every time when he would tell the story or the play got more outrageous every time and that's because we feel so good as we're telling the story because we're we're becoming alive with all of the this um adrenaline and all these like really exciting endorphins that are flooding through our bodies. And also um, from the research I did, when you recall a past win, the other thing that happens in your neural pathways and your subconscious is that it, it recalls the strategy that you used to get the win and it will help you apply that same strategy to this situation so that, you know, it might not happen instantaneously, but you might go to bed at night and then the next morning you wake up and all of a sudden you have this brilliant, brilliant idea as to how to solve your problem. Yeah, the more we utilize those, those neural pathways that are familiar in a happy sense and a successful sense that bring those memories to mind faster, the, the, that's going to be our go-to point. So um, if, you're, if you tend to have a negative viewpoint on life, then those pathways are going to be highlighted and you want to focus on the positive. So I help people get in the zone on demand. And part of that is recognition of those, those big wins that you're talking about. So what, what is the situation where I want to be in the zone? 
or in this case, talking about confidence, what feelings do I need to help me get there? And how will I know when I'm there? So recalling right. those big wins is a huge, huge part of that, your, your successes. And that also leads us into the fifth step, which is being able to find internal motivation. So seek gratification from internal motiv motivation, as opposed to taking in everything in the world or other, uh, other um, perceptions out there. We want to find something from within us that drives us to develop our personality in terms of confidence and develop our, our way of being in the world. So you can go here, the, the, the beach body is the perfect thing that I talk about. So people, there are different, I did a presentation previously um, that I'd love to talk about at a different time, but it's looking at the different motivations for exercise in different generations. So your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s and beyond, people have different motivations for exercise. So it's looking at, um, you know, I want to look good on the outside versus I want to feel good on the inside. And the steps to get you there and to, to develop that um, confidence to be in the gym or to be on the beach or wh whatever it is that you want to do to have your healthy lifestyle are different. But when we're working from the inside out, from maybe a, a health perspective as opposed to a physical perspective, it really gives us much more motivation. So the internal gratification will give you more motivation to be able to seek those situations where you are willing to take a risk to maybe not succeed 100%, but to at least try something. So you know what it's like, so you've had experience in that situation, and then learn from that, which we talked about, and that is the, the cycle of developing and maintaining confidence and being open to different situations. Okay. So what I'm hearing in this last step and, okay, so internal motivation, having that come, it's got to be a personal reason why you want it. And, yes. you know, when I, when I was married, I, and this is a true story, but I used to go round and round with my ex-husband about smoking. And so I think this is a great example because I always wanted him to quit smoking. And the thing is, um, what I've learned since is that no one can want to quit smoking until they want it for themselves. It can't be because somebody else wanted you to have it. And I also, when I was thinking about step four too, about, um, I was thinking if I'm a salesperson, you know, that because I saw my friend, um, a, my friend of Rumi's on, and I know that he's in sales. And so one of the ways you can really pump yourself up, and I think this would also feed into the internal motivation, is that if you recall the last big sale, and maybe even have coffee with a friend and like reminisce about that last big sale, that last big win, then you're creating it's, it's like you're creating a foundation of success in your mind so that you can go into this newer um, sales situation and have success. And then the next step following that up with the internal, the internal whys of why you want this. And of course, it does evolve every decade because the things, especially with business success, the reasons that I wanted that in my 20s are very different now that I'm in my 40s. You know, my children are going to college and I think in your 40s, you're looking for maybe more meaning in your life, whereas in your 20s, you're really looking to build those empires and, and build success. And, and the older you get, it becomes more about giving back. What I'm also noticing, and I can tell that, um, that you really know your stuff, is how each one of these steps builds upon the next step. So let's not forget, as we're talking about becoming internally motivated, we've already taken the time to gather the information. So we've gone through the information stage, stage, we've invested in ourselves to get the information that we need. So we've taken the classes, we've done the homework, you know, we've prepared ourselves. I like it. I can't remember which author it says the 10,000 hours, but I really love that because I know when I've hit the 10,000 hours because I don't need to look up information anymore. I've just, I've just got it. And then the reframing, because as you're trying, you know, going out into this brave new world, this morning I was watching a little video I saw on LinkedIn and it was from TD Jakes. And it was talking about how often we quit the moment we get uncomfortable. Yes. And yes. yes. 
and and the, in the video it was cute because he's like we're out there flapping our wings and it's so hard so we just give up and what he said was and of course he's a preacher so he said something like god installs that to make it to so that you get to your greatness but he were protecting ourselves from the people or we're protect god's protecting from the people who really aren't great it was really i didn't get that part as much but what i did understand is that the greatness is on the other side of the uncomfortable growth yes we have to put ourselves in uncomfortable situations and i don't mean that um in a date i have to make this clear i don't mean that in a dangerous way or it's dating dangerous, yeah <laughs> no dangerous situations no dangerous situations but we have to feel uncomfortable to make improvements so you yes. can think about that in, in your um, knowledge development, in exercise, in so many different settings, that that level of discomfort is what's going to help you move to the next level. And isn't that what happens in our culture? You know, yes. as we come, as we become very uncomfortable, whether, whether, you know, with our political views or the Me Too movement, but as things begin to get uncomfortable, that's when we begin to see change. And it takes, of course, it takes a more of a macro amount of time in a cultural situation, but this we're seeing micro, you know, on ourselves. How does this work on ourselves? So you reframe the way that you look at that failure. I actually don't even like the word failure. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, I, I try not to use that word very often. And it's so ingrained in our society that to fail means to not do something successfully. So you're, mm -hmm. you've got this weird word tangle here. It's trying it, maybe not doing it as well as you'd want to do it, and then try it again and do it better next time. When I, when I ran into trouble with that word was when I was writing the book, because when I was writing the book, you know, they, they, it, it takes a vulnerability and it, and it's really is about talking about the failures and the times in your life that you were at rock bottom. And, and in, when I very first started writing, I actually had a very, I had a difficult time doing that because I didn't look at my, my things as failures. I looked at them as opportunities to grow. And then what I did was I wrote the entire book and then I, and then once now I became much more comfortable with the writing process I went back and I rewrote those parts but I did it from a place of of accepting that I need to be able to connect with these people because they're going to be able to resonate if if I'm talking about it in this language that opens me up to to when I did something wrong because then they can truly learn from me yeah. so as we're reframing that language and we're reframing how we look at things and, and let's face it sometimes you screw up big time you know, yes. sometimes, sometimes you make a mistake and, and the mistake is going to cause a lawsuit, um, especially in my business, you know, mistakes cause lawsuits. Um, sometimes it's going to cost a client and it's a vulnerable thing to be able to go to that client and say, look, we made this mistake and we're correcting it, but they have, you know, they have skin in the game too. So your mistakes, especially when they affect someone else, they can be really difficult to, to uh, move on from. And, and I know with my staff, because occasionally, you know, this happens with, with staff, I always tell them it's very important that you don't internalize this. You know, you just look at it as what can we do to prevent this from happening next time? And there's always a solution for that. So I really love that these three pieces together just fit what do they call it, like peas and carrots. They just fit so well together. So then moving on to the fourth step, which is, okay, I got to try to remember it because, um, I'm not taking notes and okay. recall past success, recall past wins. Yeah. Yes. And that's the same one actually in my step five step. You'd think I would remember that one recalling past wins because it's going to connect you from a, from even a, a neuroscientific standpoint, it's going to connect you to some real magical places in your brain and bring forth some ideas. And then that internal motivation checking in with, you know, sometimes I'll even ask myself a question, like give, tell me, I, I, I'll ask myself this question, but you know, Hey self, what, what are the 10 reasons that I want this in my life and what are what is going to happen in my life as a result of achieving this so whether it's you know something that is in because a, a lot of these things that we're talking about if it were easy it wouldn't be uncomfortable right right and, and one uh, one of my favorite tips to help people get right in that that zone of happiness um, which is going to help you build that confidence is to to physically print I have stuff actually printed all over the place print things and I still create photo books that you can flip through that aren't electronic I love my electronic photo books I love you know photos on Facebook all that but I love to look at my 
photographs and my happy memories and and you know I've got sitting right in front of me I have I don't know 15 race medals from from half marathons and other races that I've done so to have your successes accessible to you visually is going to really make an impact on some of that neurology that you talked about earlier. Yeah, I completely agree. So before I, before I hand it over to anyone's questions, and like I said, you can type your questions in the chat, in the Q&A, or you can click the raise your hand feature, and I'm happy to bring you on camera if you have a camera, or just turn on your audio so you can talk to us, because we would love to hear from you. Any thoughts, any feedbacks, or any questions? Do you have any final thoughts for us before we go into that? I, uh, I just think that everybody is capable of building and maintaining confidence. And the more supportive people you put around you and the more open you are to experiencing the world in a positive way, because there's so much, I mean, I can't even make any comments about our world today. But besides like all that, there's a lot of good in the world. And so choose to see the good in the world. That doesn't mean ignore the bad. That doesn't mean continue to advocate for what is right. But you, we, we must um, take the initiative to have positive thoughts in our mind, which will lead to that confidence. And once you get that feeling of confidence, it's very, um, it's very nice. <laughs> so you're going to want to have that experience over and over again. And the more you put yourself in that little risk zone of feeling uncomfortable, then you, you're just gonna be like, oh, that's not so bad. So your body's gonna feel physiologically, neurologically, what it's like to feel uncomfortable and immediately followed by, oh, that wasn't so bad. So it takes the fear out of building that confidence too. I love that part too, tying it in with fear, because I have, especially lately, I've been talking a lot about empowerment and about disempowerment. And one of the things that I'm saying is that everything you create from a place of empowerment, meaning that, you know, all of these things, that the confidence, the under, the knowing inside, outside, backwards and forwards, having the information, you know, knowing that you can make your way through this, knowing you have past wins, being internally motivated, that's a perfect set up for the feeling of empowerment and everything you create from a place of empowerment because empowerment is a state of being it's it's going to show up faster stronger better longer lasting and most importantly it's going to make a greater impact now if we look at the flip side of that and we're talking about disempowerment then that's really everything coming from a place of fear and whatever you manifest out of this place of fear or disempowerment as a state of being is going to be stressful chaotic uncertain as well as as it feels like you're trudging through the mud to get through it. Now, I think that for me, what I found is if I am feeling in that place of disempowerment, instead of trying to force a force to create something, then that's the time to step back and check in with these steps. That's the time to step back and say, I need to take care of myself for a hot minute so that I can, because I find that actually switching from disempowerment to empowerment is not that hard so long as you have some tools to be able to do that. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions, and please continue. If you have a question, just let us know. We'll be happy to answer it. And uh, Michelle, Dr. Michelle, please tell anyone watching or watching the replay where they can find you if they want to follow up. Sure, you can find me at drmichellecaroulis.com, and I believe my name will be spelled on the replay, so you can see that. It's um, Dr. -E D-R-M-I-C-H-E-L-E-K-E-R-U-L-I-S.com. You can also find me under the same name on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Very good. And I have to tell everyone that um, ever since I've gotten to know Michelle, you know, we, we really are very good collaborators together. We think along, there's, there's just a synergy in the way that we think, and it's been really, really amazing. So if you guys have any feedback for me today, I would love to have Dr. Michelle on here again to talk about some other concepts. And we've also put uh, the link for Dr. Michelle's website in the chat. So you'll be able to find it there. We'll also put it in the replay webinar so long as we have that, that capability. So thank you for, thank you, Michelle, for being here. And thank you for all of the participants. I really appreciate it. And uh, hope that you tune in uh, next week. I've got a really amazing training with, um, with my friend, Kimberly Rich, who just 
who we do have a great tips coming in. Next week, I'm going to be talking to Kimberly Rich. She did, a she did an amazing TED Talk on having regrets. And so if you want to tune in next week, we'll be talking to my great friend, Kimberly. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Hey, this is Mary. Thanks so much for watching. Check out a free chapter of my book, Conscious Communications, at maryshores.com forward slash free chapter. The link is in the description below.